So welcome everyone to the session patterns to old team test automation transformation by Marit PRV. We are glad Marit can join us today. So without any further delay, over to you, Marit. Good afternoon from my part. Uh, I've been spending this morning thinking about uh, things that uh, preparing and rewriting particularly this talk gave me around the fact that I currently work in an organization where I have multiple teams. Uh, I can roughly say that each of the teams uh, cost about 1 million euros a year to exist. And I've been thinking a lot in terms of, of what's the value that we're providing and what's the role of test automation in all of that. And how can we kind of uh, create a way of testing, including test automation, that gets so intertwined into the DNA of what we're paying for uh, that it's almost like if you think in terms of, of having a good steak, eating a really good steak, that fat that you, you have all around like marbled into the, the grain of the, the meat, uh, you consider that good in, in some circles at least, uh, having testing that you can't really separate from the rest of it. That's kind of the, the goal that I find myself uh, working against. So I wanted to talk today uh, on the experiences we've had on moving uh, towards the whole team idea of test automation, kind of like intertwining it so that you can't say that testing would be something that is done by testers. You wouldn't say that test automation is done by a particular person, but it's actually something that the entire team contributes on. And obviously we have different skills and different interests uh, by, by different people. And I'm assuming also in watching this video or watching this, this streaming right now, uh, some of you will have a kind of like a developer test automation development background. Some of you might have a, a testing background. Some of you might have a management background. And I kind of personally, I uh, shift between these different kinds of roles and not really sticking to a single one, but, but kind of doing improvement in all the, the different kinds of, of, of statuses. So uh, I work currently at Vaisala, and at Vaisala, uh, well, the way we do test automation is, is that a lot of the projects and a lot of the products that we're, we're putting out, uh, they are embedded systems, and then there's some kind of a cloud or software backend where you collect a, a load of data and you have functionalities that are either on the embedded piece or it might be on the, on the uh, online uh, software piece that you have. And obviously, because of that, we've built our own uh, things around test automation, which is called Plexus. So technically, uh, we have this thing we call within the company. We have a, a fancy own name. You can not Google for it. You can not find it. It's something that is built in the company. And it's a basically a particular Python library, uh, well, or set of Python libraries with one of the special aspects to it is that it's able to drive hardware interfaces. So you can turn off an embedded device. You can do long presses on physical buttons. You can do short presses. You can control uh, power, uh, whether you have power uh, or not. And all the things that are kind of hardware related, those are also automatable for us. And that's kind of what makes makes uh, the core of our test automation and a lot of the considerations. So uh, we have a robot framework because of it. Someone built this library for hardware driving into robot framework. And when we have user interfaces, it's typically Selenium. That's kind of what the baseline of most of the organization is. And there are very few teams anymore that don't do test automation as a default. If you have someone specializing in testing in the team, it is very typical that that someone nowadays is hired to do test automation first and testing second, kind of like both of those, of course, are expected, but without test automation skills, uh, it's very rare that we have those people. We have a few of them around still uh, building kind of the, the hardware systems, but most of the people are actually driving things uh, with automation. Uh, however, the environment that we work in, it's not very static. 
So uh, we've also been replacing some of the robot framework because we've been noticing that robot framework really isn't a, a technically most likely foundation for the whole team to participate in automation. It's a new language for all of the developers in the team. And if the developers already are working in typically either C or Python or some of them Java, JavaScript, they are usually much more happy into going into some what they consider a real full uh, open uh, language uh, for, for creating the test automation. So we found that when we moved some of our test automation, not replacing it completely, but moving some of our test automation over to PyTest, and again, using Selenium for driving the user interfaces, we had the whole team kind of joining in to, to contribute. And obviously, when the whole team is joining to contribute, there's more voices, which also means we've started to uh, experiment a little bit more with Playwright at Advisor. So in addition to this, uh, we also have teams that are really kind of like by their DNA and identity. They don't think in terms of embedded systems being part of their, their thing at all. So they don't need to work with that uh, world where you have the hardware interfaces that you can also drive with Python and, and a library uh, built on top of robots. So uh, we have also teams that are kind of fully software teams. They might be in JavaScript world. Well, actually, typically, they are very much in JavaScript and Java world. Uh, some of them are doing Kotlin, again, a wide variety of languages. And there, it seems that the choices of tools that we're usually going for nowadays seems to be that it's either Cypress or it's Playwright. So overall, all of these things exist in the organization in a good and friendly manner. They're all doing the work of testing that needs to be done as of today, and there's no kind of particular interest in getting rid of any of them. Uh, it's just that people are kind of, you know, building different things with different kind of, of frameworks and, and, and using that. So I wanted to kind of start from the point of view of what technologies are we using, because that's usually the thing that people come and ask in the end if I don't start with it. But I then want to go back to you know, uh, my previous organization and a couple of years where I started kind of looking at the success of test automation from the perspective that I've been doing testing for 25 years. I've been part of things or part of projects where there's been test automation for maybe like almost 20 out of that. So there's always been some level of test automation. And for a lot of years, I felt like the test automation, it existed in this like small silo. It wasn't really bringing the benefits. It was somebody's hobby project that we were financing. And typically looking at year over year, uh, over some years, it always vanished. Typically when that one person left the organization, uh, nobody else was willing to continue with whatever the organization had invested in. And I don't consider that success. But I was working at F-Secure a couple of years ago, and I was writing then uh, out of that project, I wrote this article. You can, you can read the details of that organization from, from, from this article. Uh, but what we were looking at basically is this idea that uh, we had built a very different kind of system and we were really, really happy with the benefits and the results that it was giving us. And uh, we had basically, uh, uh, well, we had had nose test as the runner. So there was Python world. Uh, we replaced it with PyTest. We have very, very little of Selenium. And a lot of people, when they were thinking in terms of why are we successful, they were actually quoting the idea of not having almost any any user interface tests and being able to test on the API level pretty much anything and everything we needed to do. That was the general understanding technology wise, but also for the successes that we were seeing, people were saying that the, the services that we had, like we could have a Windows virtual machine at our fingertips ready to be you know, used uh, operated, run tests on for manual and automation testing, but for automation in particular, in less than five seconds. And, and that is something that uh, we're still struggling to do with the publicly available virtualization services in the cloud. Uh, so replacing that in build house built system over the years, it actually made the testing a little slower and the fast feedback, the fast uh, availability of that environment, it really drew 
uh, the whole teams and the developers in the teams also into contributing, into building this, this automation. And it was like Lego blocks, you know, like you add a piece when you realize you need a piece, you could replace a piece uh, and you would have different parties, multiple business lines in the organization contributing to the same technological platform. So I thought this was, you know, amazing and, and successful. So I started looking at, for the purposes of that article uh, that we wanted to write, I started looking at what did we do particularly well with that test automation? Because it actually wasn't just technological, kind of like, you know, we did this great architecture. It wasn't the choices of the technology. It was never the tools, but it was something else in the organization. We wanted to understand what were those things in the organization that made it worthwhile for us to, to pay for all the people who were doing doing that testing. And there were never these you know, considerations of, of how much we're investing or are we investing too much or, or uh, is it worth paying for this automation? So it was kind of evident uh, for various levels of the organization that things were well. And then comparing that back to my, my current organization, so definitely different architectures, different things, but uh, with the same kind of criteria of success and fail, I've been around my organization in different projects and, and different uh, uh, teams responsible for various things. Uh, and we've had automation in every single one of these. Uh, and I'm calling uh, three of these teams that I've been at a success. Uh, four of these teams, I would call them fails uh, in the sense that the business isn't getting uh, the benefit and the value that they have. Automation looks perfect. And if I ask any of the testers in these teams, they think they are doing well. But in scale of, of kind of looking at, is it really fitting my criteria of success in automation, which means that we keep the things around even when the people leave, uh, I kind of, you know, divided also on the, the three others. So so uh, success and failure, it's not just a snapshot. It, uh, well, it is a snapshot in time in that sense that it's not something that stays the same uh, over a longer time. So let's then talk about what is this particularly well? Like what, do you, what does that then mean? And what does that uh, look like? Uh, particularly well for me looks usually like this. So I call this whole team test automation. And one of the things that I've, I've done in the recent years in order to uh, illustrate this is to use tools that help visualize the reality that is happening. So I took a video with a tool called GORS uh, that visualizes uh, one of our code bases that I consider successful. And the success looks like many different colored people moving around different places, willing to make changes pretty much continuously. I have similar videos of the non-successful teams. It usually looks like one person making careful changes in, in one area or one person making a lot of changes in one area and, and, and kind of having that testing available and keeping it up to date kind of as a service. But the real success is where it stays even when the people leave the organization, where they give the benefit where this automation gives the benefit for the organization in the long term, even after we are gone from doing it, they are the ones where we've managed to get test automation to the whole team's asset. And when one person leaves, there's always the others who will continue with it. So I suggest running GORS maybe against your own repo. And uh, just from that visualization, you can probably see whether you're fitting some of my criteria. Uh, of, of success. So uh, the reasons uh, we looked at uh, with the research that we did in my previous organization, uh, there were some things that we noticed that uh, we definitely didn't do quite as the, as the uh, literature around how do you do excellent test automation. We didn't do it the same way. Uh, uh, the article was written so that there were people like myself from within the organization, but we also had two people uh, from a research institute in Finland participating. Uh, we would do the research so that uh, in the organization we would uh, write basically down how we worked, uh, whatever questions they asked, we would uh, is respond in writing. We analyzed all of that text on how we did. Then, then we reviewed the kind of conclusions and, and, and markings that came out of that. And, and these uh, 
conflicts were not something that I personally identified. These were things that the researchers looking at things from the outside uh, identified. Uh, they said that, uh, and these all are true in both of my organizations, we had no explicit test automation strategy. And it was weird because uh, uh, that, well, it was weird for them that we didn't have this because usually they had grown accustomed to the most of the advice that is published to say that you need to start with a really good strategy. And we didn't have anything that was considered strategy, at least not on paper. It wasn't formalized, but there were these relaxed, verbally communicated ideas uh, without any strict rules, uh, collaboratively, we were changing all of the rules that we had. We had an idea of what would good look like. That was kind of the, the thing that was driving. So you could say, in a way, the ideas existed. We had no careful tool selection. We had had that in the past in both of these organizations. But uh, it was more like, if you feel that you have energy for this tool, you're welcome to use this tool, but you need to consider that the whole team needs to be owning that tool rather than, than, than just a single person in that tool, uh, in that team. Uh, we weren't measuring uh, quality and performance of test automation. So they were asking kind of like these percentages questions uh, in, in terms of kind of like how many of your manual test cases have you automated? We had no manual test cases in either one of these organizations, actually. So we can't say what's the percentage. That feels like a conversation that we should not even be having. Uh, and the whole performance of TA, uh, well, in uh, F-Secure's case, uh, while we were doing the research, we didn't have any measures of that. Uh, in the more recent years, I've now introduced again, some measures, uh, uh, mostly for uh, visualization and management support perspective. And we had no explicit guidelines. So, so all of these were kind of weirdnesses that we, we on the way that we worked. Uh, the results uh, also, we uh, uh, reported uh, those in, in the, the 2019 uh, thing, and the pink ones are uh, now from, from Vaisala, uh, and the, the uh, uh, light uh, uh, brown ones, those are from, from F-Secure. So just to give you some ideas of what does it then look like when automation actually is looked at uh, as kind of like it's part of the whole team's DNA, and how, what's the impact of, of it being good uh, can be. Uh, well, speed to release, uh, uh, it wasn't really about automation. It was more about other practices around it. It's just basically deciding that no matter how much automation we have, we're going to be releasing based on that automation now. And uh, if it's missing things, we can add it later as well. And we learned that most of the things that had been uh, thought of as, as gates uh, towards the release were work that never needed to be done by automation or anything else. So in both these organizations, quite a, a drastic change on the release speeds in, in that term. Uh, the decreasing times, definitely automation had a lot to do with it. So if you can press a button and it does, most of you already in the pipeline and, and, and the manual activities are minimized, uh, you don't have the wait times. And the wait times are usually the, the, the big thing, thing there. Uh, team productivity, kind of like, you know, naturally going and making the changes without all the hands of uh, uh, definitely uh, something we, we followed in, in both of these organizations. Uh, we uh, considered uh, sharing, uh, reworking, uh, well, reusing code that somebody else was, was creating, uh, looking at test automation maintenance effort in that team of 11 people. Uh, we didn't even notice that we had to maintain test automation. Uh, even though we had, I think there's the number there, high test efficiency, uh, 213,708 test, eight tests run in a single working day, it still didn't feel like the maintenance was a problem. So all of these aspects of, of you know, how it shows to the customers, finding relevant issues, not causing pain in the team and not being separated from the rest of the team, these are all aspects of, of the success we considered. So that then takes us to why. And I've had now uh, a few years in, in thinking uh, in terms of, of why and what are the right things that I right now believe in. And uh, one of the things that I've learned is, well, definitely the idea that 
Uh, whatever works for me in one organization, it might not even work for me in another organization. And the other thing is that even if it works for me, it not might not always work for everyone else. There's certain level of, um, I would call it maybe clout or prestige or, or fame or intimidation status, maybe even, uh, that you get after 25 years of, of being around and, and, and doing this, this stuff consistently and speaking about it all the time. Uh, and that means that when I ask for something, I usually get it easier than, than an average person. I get it easier than most of the developers. I get it easier than most of the testers. And sometimes uh, uh, working together with all the different parties, uh, we together can come to these conclusions very quickly on, on, on wanting to do or at least experiment, try something. So framing things in terms of experiments have helped me. But this why question, it really kind of has, has made me wonder. And in the research that we did, uh, this is the why that we identified in, in, in F-Secure as organization. And again, those little stars there that I overlaid, uh, they're showing that these patterns followed me from F-Secure also to Vaisala in the sense that uh, the whole team effort, the human aspect of it needs to be shared so that it has a future even when I am gone. And as in not just me gone, but anyone who was creating that automation, continuing with it. It's not worth the investment for the organization unless that's that's true. It's uh, still the, the, the central one. And that's why I raised it in the, the center of, of this talk today. Uh, the uh, research uh, uh, people who were looking at things with me, they said that we had expert team members. This always made me laugh in the sense that, yes, we had expert team members, including the 15-year-old boy who was a 15-year-old and then 16-year-old and was considered an expert after one year of working in the industry, uh, even without actually going to any particular schools or having any particular hobbies in the, in the space of, of software creation. So uh, definitely, yes, we were expert team members. I think we were a learning team, so I would prefer uh, phrasing it differently. When you have someone, you really are trying to keep them around rather than expecting that you need to find the perfect people in the first place. None of us is perfect. Uh, even with years of experience, there's always more learning. So uh, staying expert requires continuous learning. Uh, we definitely were self-motivated and self-organized in the sense that we would uh, kind of go around the organization, have the conversations. If you wanted to do a change, you knew that uh, you would coordinate with the other ones as well. And you didn't expect someone else, like, you know, you talk to a PO and they do the running for you. You do the running yourself when you're you're driving something forward. So, so in that sense, motivated and, and organized in a way where you can feel that you're, you're uh, owning and, and, and being able able to take things forward. Uh, on the organization, organizing time, well, definitely taking the time and allowing the time that results are not perfect. But also this idea that we were not just a single team, uh, we were multiple teams, and we were working on a shared code base. Definitely a big part of, of, of good results. And this is the one where we're still most struggling with, I think, in my current organization. That's why, why the color, we are moving to that direction. But uh, uh, it's still very easy for people to kind of consider uh, my component, your component, rather than our component uh, as the, the mindset. Uh, the technical choices, uh, great infrastructure, good tool choices, uh, being able to replace tools, the testability of the product, definitely uh, important, all of these for the success. I would maybe even say that the testability of the product, that it was always a question whether we would test it in a particular way or we would change the product so that we can test it easier. And almost always in these cases of success, the change of the product so that testing is easier, more flexible and possible, coming with the whole team feeling the ownership and, and pain of the test automation. Uh, that usually help us, us to get to the, the good results. And the small incremental changes kind of processes, uh, the way that we built automation, those were, were important. So out of all of these, I raised five things that today I think are core to success. 
Uh, the first one being the idea that the language that we create our test automation in, it matters. Uh, Selenium uh, is not a language. Playwright is not a language. Languages are things like robot framework language, which is a separate uh, uh, English-like uh, way of writing code with limitations of a specialist language uh, that are not necessarily the limitations of a generalist language. Uh, Python, on the other hand, is a generalist language. So there's a lot of uh, people around. There's a big community. There's uh, availability of tools that are not just for testing purposes, but for other purposes as well. And it opens up this whole different world of taking whatever libraries you might need in order to run things on the cloud uh, to uh, uh, maybe do some model-based testing on top of your UI automation. This is something we can do with the generalist language and the, the more openly available libraries, which we couldn't do with the specialist language. And in particular, the mindset of the people on where they need to grow. It's not that they have to be there today, but where they need to go is that they need to grow to be fully-fledged programmers who can uh, contribute something today and something more in a wider scale tomorrow. So typically it would also grow us into this, this uh, generalizing specialist when we were sharing the language and getting the feedback on our programming skills across the entire team, instead of having just few people in the testing team who were kind of focusing on, on what uh, the, the best looking test cases, uh, most useful test cases for us look like in, in, in automation. So this is a core for us, uh, looking at all the failed teams in Vaisala, or, well, they are not failed teams, they are still doing useful automation, but in my terms, not the best teams that I'm looking for in terms of, of, uh, of where we are growing uh, with the whole team continuation. Typically, the difference comes uh, with the generalist language allowing the developers not having to learn yet another language to be contributing. And it's not that the developers can't learn the robot framework language, for example. They do learn that, quite many of them actually have, but there is also a large uh, section of the developers that we've been, well, I've been working with, who basically say that they're so busy with the other things that they have the excuse of not going into that, that other language. So making the, the threshold as small as possible, definitely a pattern for our success. Uh, another pattern uh, that we were really using a lot, I think, is, is this visualizing testing depth and coverage. So I call this, this theme more like a, a theme of how to get management of your back so that you can do good work. So a lot of times product owners, uh, different levels of managers deciding on the investment that we're doing, they have all these detailed questions on why does it take so long for you to write a single test case? Or they might have these questions of, of uh, how much time did it take? Did you also have time to do the release testing while, while you were doing this test automation thing? They have to work in terms of, of uh, kind of how much do we invest in manual testing and how much we invest in automation testing, if we are able to get away from, from these conversations and get to the conversations of how can we do the testing today so that some of it and more of it continuously is getting automated and getting supported by these tools, changing kind of the DNA of how we talk in the organization, then that helps. And in terms of giving some kind of visuals, uh, showing the number of, of uh, epics uh, and, and, and requirements. We usually think in terms of epics come from product owners and they include or are linked to the requirements. Knowing how much of that we, we cover with our automation, not how much of the manual test we cover, but how much automation we at least have that is related to our epics and being able to say that we have a percentage and it's, it's growing. 39% of our epics is actually a really small number, but this is already a number that is helping this particular team that I, I look, took the numbers from doing a really good job 
with, with continuously releasing products from a type of business, uh, including embedded uh, software, where they used to think they can do frequent uh, releases. We also uh, describe um, uh, test automation reliability. So how much green are we seeing? Uh, that seems to be the thing we need most management support on. So even when they care for, is it green or not? instead of thinking of how many tests we have, don't care about that really from the management point of view, care for, is it green? Is it causing a lot of maintenance work for you? Or is it actually just doing the work kind of quietly and that the red means actually something other than, than having to do uh, surprise work? Uh, caring for that uh, definitely helped us. And then the lead time to reliable kind of like uh, uh, building a ways of working within the team so that when you do a breaking change that you know will break the test automation, maybe fix the test automation as you go, uh, maybe tell uh, that it's coming in uh, soon, something that breaks, so that you don't have to start from uh, basically wondering what broke and then trying to fix it while other things are breaking. So our lead time to reliable in the last year with the, the team that I had the visualization from, it used to be a month uh, uh, to get the test automation fixed by, by major effort in that team. And now it's, it's typically still hours even after I am gone from that team. So again, uh, moving around is, is a great way for seeing if things stick after someone leaves. Uh, I showed the, the, the video earlier. I just took it as a background picture here on showcasing progress made of continuous flow of small changes. So teaching managers maybe uh, to care a little less of how many exactly, like numbers, uh, showing managers uh, the progress in a visual way, showing that there's new branches that we're working on and having more meaningful conversation than just looking at the numbers usually helps in, in, in getting things things forward. Uh, the choices uh, on not just automation, but uh, the way where you could, I would maybe say this is the strategic thinking, looking at it in the hindsight, starting from the idea that you can choose to not test manually when you're making a release. You can choose that. You can test while you're implementing the features and try to kind of think what the changes have an impact on and you can explore them and maybe you can write automation also for the new features so that you can see that they work in the context of the product that you're working on. But at the time when you decide you're gonna make a release and you move that uh, product of yours from one environment to another, or maybe you, you handpick certain changes and, and you build a, a, a build that is somehow separate, uh, ready for that release. At the time when you do that activity, that kind of moving from feature time work of testing to release time of testing, you can just make the what used to be three months of work, you can make it uh, one day by choosing not to do things. I've done this now with three different organizations and more teams than I, I care to count. And it's actually the number one pattern that has proven useful to me in getting the teams thinking about test automation and contributing to test automation in a good way. By taking away the time of catching things later on and having to build that in introducing test automation, introducing other kinds of ways of, of also exploring and figuring out if the changes are, are having an impact. So moving the work elsewhere, I used to talk maybe five, six years ago, I used to talk about the idea of doing continuous deployment without test automation. And that's basically this idea that you can choose to release with whatever automation you have. And the 39% automation we talked about uh, with one of my teams, that is definitely already a really good, maybe even a better level of regression uh, testing that we're running on the releases now by moving basically the whole focus of, on, on the, the feature testing time, following the changes and introducing continuously a little bit more automation incrementally. Uh, finally, 
my uh, uh, fifth uh, idea here that I want to talk about on, on the patterns that, that has really helped me is that uh, to get to the whole team, it's not that straightforward. Uh, you need to ask uh, for people to spend time on automation that normally don't. Uh, I would usually have these conversations with product owners and make sure that every single developer had a week or couple of weeks of time of doing some kind of contributions or, or tasks that were related to test automation. By doing, you learn the, the practices of, of how would you go about kind of doing it uh, doing it as part of your regular work. So getting the chance of learning by doing, need to make space for that. But also you need it, well, I need it at least uh, to grow the individual competencies by doing the work with people. So it's not just management, it's actually doing the work uh, either in what we call ensemble testing format or in a pair testing format. I mentioned the 15-year-old, the way that they grew in six months and in a year is that we regularly paired with them, uh, well, sitting next to them uh, when we were not remote, and now by sharing screen so that whoever is with less experience and more need of learning, that's the person on the keyboard. And all the commands, all the ideas of what we're doing, they are going to be held uh, deciding on the priorities is going to be held by the person not on the keyboard. So it's not watching the junior code, but it's uh, uh, watching the junior be the hands of the more senior who doesn't get to do anything other than use their words in order to get the coding to happen. Uh, I've had teams, multiple teams, uh, learning to do Selenium tests that uh, they had a hard time figuring out how to get the whole team to do by just running a couple of these ensemble testing sessions where we would create our first tests together. We would struggle together, we would grow together, and we would know how to do those things individually after we had seen how someone else is doing them. So having someone, one single person who knows, you can teach a group of people uh, how uh, that, that's done. And it's a really powerful thing. But also you can do that on a regular basis. Whenever you get stuck uh, saying, instead of you know writing, I get this error message to someone more senior than you or someone of, well, not even more senior, another senior in your organization. Instead of going and, 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 and you know, copy pasting that and going into this ping back and forth in messages, just kind of call the person, share the screen, work together, a really powerful way of, of, of doing things. Uh, I took some screenshots uh, from yesterday because we were doing this style of ensemble testing in one of the sessions and somebody uh, uh, shared this on, on Twitter. This is what uh, learning uh, to do Selenium 4 in an ensemble uh, looked like yesterday. We had four very lovely volunteers. And what I find interesting is that uh, sometimes in ensembles, what we need to learn is not how to write the code, but how to contribute to the code, uh, speaking up about what we want to be done next, knowing when to correct the others, and, and, and kind of like, you know, uh, uh, clarifying some of the things we've learned that we think are essential. So kind of taking a pause for the important uh, conversations, not explaining everything, but, but figuring out how to do things. I took this as an example of, personally, I'm looking at the, the lines 50 and 51 here. Uh, latitude, longitude printed uh, so that we can see them. I personally so much prefer just putting like a, 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 a break point in code and looking at it with the, the development tools. And I didn't know how to do that uh, seven years ago before I started ensemble testing. I knew how to write this print stuff but I didn't know how to do the debugging. But working with the developers in the same ensembles, it taught me that there's a better way for doing pretty much anything that I knew how to do. And again, interestingly, doing things in a group are usually more difficult because there's both the learning and the contributing. And when you do things alone, it all feels so much simpler. I, I did the same or similar kind of thing on my own machine. Uh, on, on Python, like a different language, the one that I, I prefer to use nowadays uh, because of what I'm right now living in. Uh, I used to live in, 
in, in different worlds. Now I'm, I'm in, in, a, in a Python world. And again, like when I take a screenshot, even of my own pieces of examples that I just wrote, I have these needs of explaining that, yes, I know that the semantic selectors, yes, they are, they exist in various libraries. They are also in Selenium and they're actually really lovely things of Selenium 4, but uh, maybe we shouldn't be using them. I just tried them here. So yes, I know I shouldn't be. And I had the other way of implementation as well, but it, I didn't want to take screenshots of everything. And there's always this you know weirdnesses of, of of your ide for example uh, where red should mean that it's not passing but the icon is passing so there's bugs that also cause you some of these this weirdnesses so all of this uh, these patterns they really have driven me uh, to this idea of improved understanding of what success in test automation looks like the success is not uh, writing 100 lines or 1000 lines or 10000 lines of code or having this amount of numbers of test cases running. Success is being able to uh, move fast, uh, being able to uh, rely on whatever we've built and being able to also use test automation, not just on, on regression aspects, but also on extending the testing. So sometimes uh, my main use of automation is, you know, I create a Selenium script that monitors whatever is happening on the user interface where there's new information coming usually every five seconds. That's the type of kind of streaming application that I work with right now. And then I look for patterns in the the uh, in the in logs that I created on uh, are they, you know, changing over the whole working day of mine in the way that I thought I want them to change. So instead of, you know, sitting and, and, and watching things for exploratory purposes, I have automation collecting me the things that I want, and then I can look at whatever the automation produces for me. So for me, the success with the whole team thing has meant that we have no separation anymore on the manual and automated testing. And this uh, style of testing and expecting test specialists, test automation specialists and manual testers to intertwine into just doing different kinds of tasks at different time. Uh, this is what I call contemporary exploratory testing. And I don't think manual and automated exploratory is not manual. Exploratory is actually both of these. And that's the style of, of working that we need to learn. So some of the expert team members is really around uh, this mindset of, of building things. So that's what I, I had to share on, on our experiences. And I'd happy, I'm would happy i happy to kind of uh, take some questions and and. Uh, at any time, you know, have any conversations. So there's some of my contact information here. Uh, I prefer uh, Twitter DMs. That's kind of my my uh, uh, fast tracked way of, of getting to talk with me. Uh, also LinkedIn. Uh, I kind of collect people uh, professionally there. So so if you want to link with me, I, I'd be happy to to do so. So I guess it's time for questions. So the first question here is on uh, for the projects and teams uh, that I considered fail or not successful in this whole team test automation. What first step would I suggest to bring the change and move towards success? Uh, I work with these teams still, and I have made the, the suggestions uh, uh, pairing developers and testers. So not making it uh, a single person called testers responsibility, to maintain that test automation, but sharing the responsibility. And it's usually something where uh, just asking the, asking the, uh, asking the product owner to allow for that, uh, the developers are more than happy to jump in. So as long as you make space with the expectations, uh, this happens very easily. Okay. So. We looks like yeah, yeah we have one, one. Yep, yeah, one more. So there's this question on uh, pair or ensemble testing, and that's it. it's valid concept when the number of resources billable is greater than one, and then uh, well, there might be client consultant confidentiality. Uh, in a way, you're right, but I actually. Uh, uh, don't do ensemble testing for learning purposes, just on the real code that we work on. I also do this online with random people of the internet. And it's not that I would share them the, the 
confidential thing that we're building. I would look for some other application that has some of the challenges that we have. I think one of my great examples on this one is, is that I meet about every, well, every two weeks with two wonderful ladies, Alex Schladebeck and Elisa, uh, Elizabeth Zagroba. Uh, we do uh, currently playwright uh, learning together. Uh, we have now decided our next focus is on, on learning to do shadow doms. Uh, we did some work on, on this location-based stuff that we also ensembled yesterday in this conference and, and kind of like choosing different things that we have to do in the real projects and, and then practicing together. Uh, we are at different places. We're all seniors. We're at different places and we are at a great position to teach uh, one another. It might not be your billable hours, but... Uh, what I've learned uh, from the community way of working hands-on on real projects, uh, that's the reason why I'm paid relevantly more than any of the developers that I work with. And uh, if you think in terms of one move on your personal career, you're learning and, and somehow turning that up, uh, not just accepting that, you know, if your company isn't investing in you, that that's where you are. I would maybe go and, and, and figure out a way. So there's people like myself, there's people like Lisi Hocke. Uh, we do these, these tours, kind of like, you know, we, we go around different uh, people and, and work with them and learn with them. And I'm convinced that the community is open to everyone on, on figuring out some way of doing this. Thanks, Marit, for sharing your experience with us today.